Well, good morning. Today, we begin a whole new sermon series. It's titled, Finding God in a Broken World. It's a study in the book of Psalms. And I have to tell you that in all my years as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, and that means from the time I can remember, I've been in church. I've heard hundreds of thousands of sermons and sermon series, but I don't think I've ever heard a whole series of sermons about the Psalms. You know, it's the biggest book of the Bible. There's 150 chapters, actually 150 Psalms. If you open your Bible to the middle, like the one right in front of you, you come right to the Psalms. You know, it was several years ago that I started to hear that the Psalms are actually songs or prayers. And about the same time, I started to hear from a respected teacher that he includes a psalm in his daily devotions and that the psalms are just a really good way to learn to pray because they are prayers just as much as songs. And so I tried it. And then I've kept trying it now for about 10 years. And you know what happens if you read a psalm a day? you will have read the entire book of Psalms two and a half times in a year. Now, I know sometimes it takes a long time for me to notice things, but between reading and learning in classes, I saw that the Psalms is actually made up of five books of Psalms, you know, like five hymnals just rolled up, jammed in as one, and each one has a theme of its own. There's a motion, a direction, even a sort of plot within the Psalms. So one day, as I was thinking and praying about what our next series of messages should be about, I have to say, and I I believe it was the Lord leading me, leading us to look at the Psalms together and to look at the themes, teaching, theology that we can learn from them. And what can we learn about our relationship with God and our understanding of life from this book of ancient songs and just how it changes us. I guess I should probably start with just a little bit of a warning that this message is going to be a little heady. It's going to have a little bit more direct teaching about some technical stuff about the songs than I usually have in a message. But hang on, I think you'll find that it's helpful that launches us to get to the good stuff. So first I want to tell you one of the reasons I steered away from the Psalms for so long is that I'm really not a poetry guy and most of the Western world is really not about poetry. What much more left brain language, prose, science, grammar kinds of people. Poetry is just one unit or chapter in our high school English classes. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand, but I'd be willing to guess that if I ask everyone who loves poetry or goes to a bookstore to look for books of poetry, there's not going to be many people whose hands would go up. And yet, there's actually more poetry in the Bible than any other form of writing. Poetry is all about images, the arts, word pictures. It's very right brain. And by the way, left-handed people are right brain dominant. The point being, I believe one of the reasons for poetry in the Bible is so that it reaches both sides of our brains that God made in the first place. The Psalms literally feed a part of our brains created by God that is not fed by other kinds of writing. Now, there are several different kinds of psalms in the Bible. There are laments. Laments, those are poems about how rotten everything is for me right now. Complaints, really. Complaints to God that there are more psalms of lament than any other kind of psalm. You know, people sometimes say that the Bible and Christianity is all 
pie in the sky, rose-colored glasses, everything's wonderful. It's that kind of rubbish. But if they think that, they haven't read the Psalms. Then after lament, there's hymns of praise. There are royal psalms, psalms about the crowning of the coming king. There's psalms of thanksgiving and wisdom and even psalms that tell about history. But perhaps the strangest of all the psalms are called the imprecatory psalms. They're strange to our sensibility that God is a loving God and we're even supposed to love our enemies because the imprecatory psalms are songs that call on God to wipe out the enemies, even wiping out babies. But all in all, the psalms are responses to the incredibly wide range of what happens in a life of faith. And a lot of what happens just really stinks. And if you don't like to know the end of the story or the movie before it happens, Here's a spoiler alert. Close your ears for just a moment because I'm going to tell you the overall message of the book of Psalms, even in the midst of all this stuff. It is this. God reigns. Even in the midst of what seem horrific circumstances, affliction, oppression, the poor, needy, weak, meek, persecuted, in the midst of all of it, God reigns reigns. He rules. The Psalms are about finding God in a broken world. So, each week for the next five weeks, we're going to look at the first Psalm of each of the five books of Psalms. So it'll be Psalm 1, Psalm 42, Psalm 73, 90, and 107. Today, it's Psalm 1. So, now, before we get there, I want to show you just a big coincidence, if you call them a coincidence. Do you believe in coincidences? I don't know. All of the detectives on the murder mysteries that I like to watch, they don't believe in coincidence. When Nicky Gumbel, the founder of Alpha, was asked about whether prayer works or if it's just coincidences, he says, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that when I pray, good coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. So, I want to show you a picture of what was taken when Lucy and I were on vacation on October 14 of 2022. So there it is. It was Wake Up Call. Wake Up Call is a daily devotional that is just fantastic. I read it every day. And I have to tell you a little bit more about Wake Up Call. I've, I've never been a devotional guy. All the ones that I looked at just seemed kind of thin, and I decided for many, many years to just go straight to the Bible. But I was introduced to Wake Up Call from Seedbed. It's mostly written by J.D. Walt, who is the former dean of the chapel at Asbury Seminary. So it's now part of my daily routine with the Lord every morning. Anyway, here's the wake-up call from October 14, 2022, and the title of this one is Why Delight Must Come Before Discipline. It's a wonderful in-depth devotional about Psalm 1. And you know what today is? October 13, two years later. Coincidence? Well, God's leading. Hmm. So, Psalm 1 is the opening act of the entire book of 150 Psalms. Blessed is the person who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the mockers, but whose delight is in the law, whose delight is in the word of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Delight. Not about trying hard, not about workouts or discipline, or at least at the start. It's about delight. And delight comes before discipline. 
Now, I'm going to risk it. Risk that <laughs> you might think I'm being lazy because I'm going to read for you a little bit longer quote from J.D. Walt from the Wake Up Call because I just don't think I can say it any better. So, uh, before I do that, let me read you all of Psalm 1 first. So here's how it goes. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock, my redeemer, my friend. Now, here's what J.D. Walt wrote about delight comes before discipline. He wrote, how does one sow the word of God in their heart and mind? I'm so glad you asked. In my considered judgment, nothing is more critical than this question. If we do not deliberately and consistently plant the word in the fields of our hearts and minds, we will be left with soil and then weeds. Without source and substance, we will be left with thin sentiment of our own sincerity. And sincerity without substance, my friends, will along with the dollar buy you a senior coffee at McDonald's. Sincerity without substance is like icing without cake. So how does one sow the word of God in their heart and mind? Blessed is the one whose delight is in the word of the Lord and who meditates on his word day and night. So here's a great truth. Duty and discipline do not produce delight. The opposite is true. The first disciples did not become disciples because of their dutiful discipline, dedication to the word of God. No, it was their delight in this person Jesus of Nazareth, that led them to behind the building project of their former lives and abandon themselves to him, who alone has made the words of eternal life. In other words, it starts with Jesus of Nazareth, the word made flesh, who by the Holy Spirit teaches and trains us through the inspired word of Holy Scripture, which in turn increases our delight unleashing our devotion, becoming, in time, a life of flourishing fruitfulness. The order cannot be overemphasized. Remember what Jesus said to the most sincere, scripturally dedicated people of his time. That would be the Pharisees. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. And these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. John 5, verses 39 and 40. It begins with the word, Jesus Messiah, or it never begins. He leads us into the scriptures, and the scriptures lead us to an ever fully abiding relationship with him, and on this way, he introduces us to his Father and ours, who with him fills us with the Holy Spirit, and on we go. So writes J.D. Walt. You see, it all begins with the light. Blessing begins with filling ourselves with the words, the stories, the poetry, the word pictures of the scriptures. 
not for the purpose of becoming an encyclopedia of Bible knowledge. I mean, we've all probably met someone who uses the Bible as a club. That's not it. It's about filling ourselves so that we can be delighted. I mean, maybe that's why many of us have enjoyed the chosen so much. While it's biblically accurate in the chosen, we get to see Jesus as a guy that we would all want to meet, sit down with, talk with. We take delight in Jesus. And as a result, we want to know him more. We delight in God and his word because he is the kind of person who blesses the poor in spirit, who blesses those that mourn, who blesses the meek, the hungry, the underdog. We delight in God who stands up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. You see, the opening stanza, the opening act of 150 psalms is to delight in the words, delight in the law of the Lord, like the law of gravity, delight in the Lord and dwell on it, think about it, meditate on it all the time. That's who's truly blessed. Deep down to the core, comforted by the scriptures, by God himself. But to get what that means, there's just not enough explaining words. There needs to be a, a metaphor, a right brain directed word picture, and that's what happens in Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. It's not about walking or sitting or standing, specific actions. Rather, it's delight is where the blessed, content, deep down, joyful life begins. And here it is. Are you ready for it? The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, a tree that yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. So, you know, it may not look like it now, but the roots of that tree become strong. Faith becomes strong and faithful like a tree in full leaf and full fruit by running water even in the midst of drought. How? By taking delight, delight in the words of the Lord. The alternative? The alternative to being a tree by the river with deep roots Bearing fruit, the alternative, is like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, like chaff. Chaff, that, that's the outer husk of a grain of wheat, the chaff that literally falls off and blows away when the grains of wheat are thrashed to make it fit for eating. In other words, those who are not delighting in the Lord, the, the wicked, yes, it says that the wicked may look good now, but there's no depth, unstable, and wither when the strain and struggle of life bears down. And yes, it's not so the wicked. It's a preview, a preview of the struggles, oppression, and strains, and the storms that storms of life that are part of the world in which we live, which we will encounter. So what do you think? What do you choose? A tree planted by the water with deep roots that can withstand drought and storm? Or grass planted on a rocky soil of life that withers with the heat of drought that surely comes shallow, thin, easy to blow away? choose. The Psalms will begin with a choice, a word picture choice. That's the beginning, the opening song of the prayer book of the Bible. As it says later in Psalm 37 to be exact, delight yourself in the Lord. 
Let him be your delight, and he will give you the desires of your heart. <laughs> Maybe that's one of those coincidences. That which we intentionally, on purpose, to take delight in becomes what we crave, what we desire. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the Lord. Delight comes before discipline. I'd like to offer a challenge for this week. Well, maybe not really a challenge, but an, an exercise to just see what happens. This week, pray Psalm 1 every morning. That means bring it before God. Meditate about it. Think on what it means for you this day. Pray Psalm 1 again as you lay down to sleep. And then the next day, do the same. Each day from now until next time, jot a note of what it brings to mind, delight or drudgery. Does it change as your week goes on? And then I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk with you about any experience you might have just trying this out for the next week. Let me know if you might even be willing to share your experience. Just a sentence or do nothing formal. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but whose delight is in the law, law of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this song this prayer, this song. Oh, that we would just take delight in you, enjoy your company, and that our life would go on with you, truly blessed, truly made comfortable in the full knowledge of your grace, even in the midst, even in the midst of all that life brings. Be with us through this week. Guard, guide us, keep you in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, hear this blessing from me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord turn his whole self to you and give you peace. Amen.